Well, thank you very much for the organizers, in particular, Professor Rusansky, for organizing such a conference in such a difficult time. Thank you. So to begin with, I have to say that this is my joint work with my PhD student, Shang Wen at York. And in this short talk, I will describe some results from her thesis. And in particular, I have chosen the heat semi group to be presented in this talk. Well, these are the references upon which the talk is based. The first two are basically about the classical one-dimensional Heisenberg group. And the last one is more recent work, which is more pertinent to the talk today. So of course, here I assume that the audience of this conference are familiar with the one-dimensional classical Heisenberg group. So I will begin with the non-isotropic Heisenberg group with multi-dimensional center. So I begin with M orthogonal matrices of order N with real entries with the condition that bj inverse times bk is the negative of bk inverse times bj whenever j is not k. And then we denote by b lambda a linear combination of the matrices bj, where j goes from 1 to m. And of course, we don't want this lambda to be equal to zero. And furthermore, we suppose that this matrix B lambda is invertible. Now we are going to look at the set Rn cross Rn cross Rm. It's a set and I am going to equip it with a group law given by the product of set T and set prime T prime equal to the vector, which is set plus set prime T plus T prime plus one half times the symplectic form of set and set prime. Well, of course, the symplectic form here is a little bit different from the symplectic form of the one-dimensional Heisenberg group, the classical one. So the bracket of Z and Z prime is a vector in Rm whose J entry is actually given by the dot product of X prime with bjy minus the dot product of x with bjy prime for all j from 1 to m. Well, with this group law, and as before, this group is a unimodular Lie group with Haar measure given by the Lebesgue measure. And of course, this set here is to be identified with the vectors x and y in R2n. Now, it is easy to see that the center of this new Heisenberg group is just the set consisting of the points 0, 0, and t. 
And in order to achieve this, we have to impose some restrictions on the dimensions. And in this case, m squared has to be less than or equal to n. Now, in order to talk about the heat semigroup, I have to introduce some variants of the harmonic analysis on Heisenberg groups. So to begin with, I am going to look at the so-called lambda fourier wigner transform. So I take any non-zero number, non-zero vector lambda, then we define the Fourier, the lambda Fourier Wigner transform, V lambda of f and g, to be the function on R to n by means of the integral. And the only difference here is that we multiply Q by the transpose of the vector B lambda, of the matrix B lambda. And it is an easy exercise to check that this lambda Fourier Wigner transform of F and G at Q and P is just the ordinary Fourier Wigner transform of F and G evaluated at the transpose of B lambda at Q and P is unchanged. Then the lambda Wigner transform is nothing but the Fourier transform of the Fourier Wigner transform. And then if we do some calculations, then we see that this lambda Wigner transform of F and G is the ordinary Wigner transform of F and G evaluated at again B lambda transpose times X with C. But we have a factor in front, which is one over the determinant of B lambda. All these are calculations. Now we need pseudo differential operators, but the pseudo differential operators that I use are actually the so-called pseudo-differential operators of the symmetric type due to Hermann Weyl. So I take a non-zero vector in Rm, and for simplicity, I am going to take a function sigma in L2 of R2n. Then we have this very well-known formula defining the Wigner uh, the Weyl transform, namely the inner product of the Wigner transform of f with g is the integral of the symbol sigma times the Wigner transform of f and g. Okay. And then if you use the Prancerel formula, we can express this Weyl transform in terms of the Fourier Wigner transform multiplied by the Fourier transform of the symbol sigma. Then there is a very simple relationship between this new Weyl transform with the classical one. Namely, the new one is just the old one with symbol sigma lambda, with sigma lambda given by the ordinary symbol sigma at B lambda x and C.
Well, so much for the harmonic analysis that we need. Of course, I am only sketching the backbone of all this. Now, we have a Heisenberg group. It's a unimodular Heisenberg group. Well, for studying Heisenberg group, we need left invariant vector fields. And there are many such. So we are going to pick a basis for these left invariant vector fields given by the axis and the y's together with one single one, tk. Well, not a single one, a whole bunch of them, m of them, tk. And the xj, yj, and tk are given by the formulas listed on the slide. Well, of course, for those who are familiar with this, they know where they come from. But those who do not, these are actually coming from the so-called directional derivatives along the coordinate axis x, y, and t with respect to the group law. And we can define the so-called sub-Laplacian on this Heisenberg group with multi-dimensional center. So we simply take the Laplacian, but dropping the so-called tangential component, the TK, or the central component, the TK. Now, if you expand this sub Laplacian, you are going to end up with a degenerate elliptic partial differential operator, which looks rather complicated. But it all comes from the Heisenberg group, so it's not that formidable. Well, one way about the sub Laplacian is that it's sub elliptic, okay, which is not elliptic, it's certainly hypo elliptic due to a result of Hormander. Now, I am going to convert this sub Laplacian to a family of elliptic operators on R2N. So, we simply take the inverse Fourier transform of the sub Laplacian with respect to the center. So we are going to end up with L lambda being parameterized by lambda. And this can be shown to be an elliptic operator, which is easily seen because it is just the Laplacian perturbed by lower order terms. Right. Now, in order to study these twisted Laplacians, we need Hermit functions. Okay. But here, of course, we have to modify the Hermit functions a little bit. So we define for each pair of multi-indices alpha and beta, all right? And we are, ah, there is a typo there. It should be E alpha beta lambda, okay? So E alpha beta lambda at QP is the length of lambda to the power N over two times the lambda Fourier Wigner transform of the ordinary Hermit functions, n-dimensional one, tensor products of one-dimensional Hermit functions, evaluated at suitable scales of Q and P. This alpha here is a nuisance. Then, 
we have a complete spectral analysis of the twisted Laplacians given by L lambda of E alpha beta lambda to be lambda in length to the power n times two times the length of beta plus n times E alpha beta lambda, which means that these Hermit functions are the eigenfunctions of our twisted Laplacian with eigenvalues lambda to the n times two beta plus n. And it's to be noted that here the eigenvalues have infinite multiplicity because there is one for each beta and there are infinitely many of them. All right. Now, with all these aspects around, we are now coming to the heat equation, which is well known to everybody. The heat equation governed by L lambda is as given, and the initial value is the function f, which for the time being, I take to be in L2. Now, as in the case of the one-dimensional classical Heisenberg group, we are able to compute the heat kernel of the twisted Laplacians. And they are actually given by kappa tau lambda, where tau stands for time because I have used T for the center already. And this kappa lambda tau at z and w is given by this long expression here. And unfortunately, the last terms are not visible, but it's a lambda dot, the symplectic form of z and w. The symplectic form is hidden by the beautiful pictures. Now, with this heat kernel, let's come back to the heat kernel. Then it's very easy to estimate this heat kernel. Okay, if you estimate the heat kernel, then you can see that the absolute value of the heat kernel is less than or equal to a tau where a tau can be computed explicitly. You simply drop the last part, okay? So from this immediately, we have this L1, L infinity estimate for the heat semi-group, e to the minus tau times L lambda. Now, on the other hand, we can also estimate the heat kernel, the L1 norm of the heat kernel, which is given by this one over the hyperbolic cosine of lambda to the n times tau, the whole thing to the n. So once you have the L1 norm, then we can have this L infinity, L infinity estimate easily. So interpolating using the ruiz thorin theorem, we immediately get an LP, L infinity estimate of the heat semi goal. Okay, these are fairly straightforward extensions of the results from the one-dimensional Heisenberg group. By the way, one-dimensional Heisenberg group is sometimes called by somebody the three-dimensional Heisenberg group because the underlying manifold is R3. All right. 
Now, I am going to give you another formula for the heat semigroup, which bears on the theme of this conference, pseudo differential operators. In other words, the heat semigroup can be expressed in terms of the wild transform. Remembering that the initial data is the function f, then we are going to see that e to the minus lambda f, e to the minus tau l lambda f is given by this expression here, except that we have the Fourier Wigner transform of the wild transform, whose symbol is the Fourier transform of the initial data. And this E beta are the ordinary Hermit functions in Rn. Well, you may think that this formula is rather complicated or is not good looking, but actually it can be used to do something. Now, a key step in the proof is basically the spectral analysis of the twisted Laplacian, which you can see actually from the eigenvalues. And then all these special Hermit functions, which form an orthonormal basis of L2 R2n, can be simplified to the Fourier Wigner transform of the vial transform of E beta in a product with E beta. So this is uh, basically a manipulation of the spectral analysis of the twisted Laplacian together with the spectral mapping theorem. We can have an OPL2 estimate for the heat semigroup. Well, how to obtain this? So, first of all, we take a vector lambda which is in Rn and is non zero. Then, for all positive time tau, this heat semigroup is a bounded linear operator from LP into L2. And I forgot to mention that P is actually between one and two. It's not for all P, okay? P is between one and two. So in particular, we have an L2, L2, estimates. Now here I mentioned this P between one and two. Now, if we use this LPL2 estimate, together with this LPL infinity estimate, which I described earlier, we can get the following result, telling us that whenever we have a non-zero vector lambda, then for all positive time lambda tau, we see that this heat semigroup is a bounded linear operator from LP into LQ for all P between one and two and Q larger than two and including infinity. Now, maybe I should say something about how this LP L2 estimate can be obtained. No, I don't have it here.
Now, this LP, L2 estimate actually comes from this wild transform with symbol F F hat. Now, from the one dimensional Heisenberg group, we know that the wild transform is a bounded linear operator. Well, the wild trend, well, let's take a symbol sigma. Okay, take a symbol sigma. Let's say in L2 cross L2. Then the wild transform with the symbol sigma hat. Okay, is actually a bounded linear operator from LP into L2. Whenever P is between one and two. And that's actually a fairly well known theorem that the theorem cannot be extended to P bigger than two is a result of Barry Simon. Now, it turns out that with a bit of hard work, we can also show that these wild transforms with symbol F hat is a bounded linear operator from LP into L2, okay? And there is an estimate for the operator norm of this wild transform with symbol given by the Fourier transform of F. And then transferring this estimate to the heat semigroup. We are able to get the estimate from LP into L2 of the heat semigroup. Okay. Now, what is the whole point of studying all these LP LQ estimates? I remember once I gave a talk talking about LP LQ estimates. And one audience asked me, are there LP plus LQ estimates? At first, I did not understand the question, but finally I understood the question. So LP LQ means from LP into LQ. Now, the whole point of these LP LQ estimates come from the work of uh, Brian Davies, Barry Simon and others. In the context of hypercontractivity and ultra contractivity. But of course, there are some differences because they worked with probability spaces. And here we are working with the whole space Rn. But the connection there is clear. The connection with this hypercontractivity and ultra contractivity has something to do with the so called Euclidean quantum field theory. So perhaps I should stop here. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this uh, very nice talk. Uh, are there any questions or remarks? I would like to ask a question. Yes, please. So, thank you, Professor. Um, at the very beginning, where you defined this uh, new symplectic form, you said there were some restrictions on M. Yeah. Maybe you could uh, elaborate a bit on these and. I think there is some connection to H type groups or uh, Heisenberg type yeah. groups. These are actually related to the uh, H type group or the Heisenberg type group, but they are not the same. Um, for the 
each Thai guru, they don't use BJ and BK. They use mm -hmm. one 2N by 2N matrix. Yes. And here I try to factor this 2N by 2N matrix U, also uh, orthogonal skill symmetric into BJ and BK. So they are again related, but they are not exactly the same as the H-type group. And basically they are special cases of the H-type group. Mm -hmm. Okay, because of the factorization. Yes. And maybe much. M squared less than or equal to N comes from the inspiration of the H-type group. Okay. I know Thanks. that there are some um, fallen type groups. Unfortunately, I do not remember the exact definition. And I also wondered what would be the connection between H type groups, your groups, and fallen groups. I don't Any know what the fallen group is. I guess you mean the meta, meta Heisenberg groups, yes, right? Yes. So, things like this. No, I don't know what the fallen group is. Yeah, so I cannot comment on that. So maybe maybe we should uh, forward you a a paper by Professor Falland, which uh, unfortunately has not really gained uh, a lot of attention, although it's already mm, almost thirty years old. Um, so if you would like, I could. You mean those uh, polar Heisenberg group? No, there are three-step uh, nilpotent groups, which are. Um, uh, somehow generated from given two-step uh, nilpotent groups. Mm -hmm. That's different. That's uh, you mean meta met, you mean meta Heisenberg groups. Yes. But this, these are different from this uh, from this group, I guess. Uh, but for these groups, it seems that you have also Schrodinger type representations, and so yeah, we have uh, Schrodinger type representation, which I talked about this at the ISAC conference in Macau. You, you have Five also, years ago. <laughs> you have also the group considered by Metivier corresponding to the, the stratified group of rank two for which the, the Laplace, the sub Laplacian is hypolytic analytic. And this corresponds to the condition that you put determinant of B lambda. So the non-degeneracy yeah. of the Bilinear form, so it's not exactly no, no, it's not exactly what you write. But if if you if you consider the uh, the restriction of the, the the form that you have when you consider the the bracket uh, of elements in G one and take a re, uh, representation in G two star and say that it's non degenerate for e each non. Uh, zero uh, mm -hmm. lambda uh, in the dual of G2, uh, then you have a, then a, this is a group, which is a class of group, which is more general than the H type group. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I will look into it. So it seems there are some uh, very interesting connections to some uh, other classical concepts. There should be some connection with the um, H type group. Aparajita was the first one who told me that they should be identical. And then she wrote our proof, but there is a gap in it. So now I am a bit skeptical. I think the whole thing is based on uh, the factorization of the 2n by 2n skill symmetry orthogonal guru into the b's. Are there any more questions? Uh, go with a small final one. Well, if not, then we thank the speaker again for this very nice talk. And um, we resume on uh, three minutes. Uh, meantime